So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really, really wonderful to see all of you here today in person uh, to hear about the state of the School of Public Health. My name is Rick Locke. I'm a professor here in political science and international public affairs, and I currently serve as provost. And it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to be able to welcome you to this event and to introduce uh, Dean Ron uh, Aubert. Uh, before I uh, introduce him, let me just uh, sort of share a couple of reflections about the School of Public Health. Um, I think as all of you know, uh, next year uh, we'll mark the 10th year anniversary of the School of, of Public Health here at Brown, uh, and it's been an amazing uh, trajectory. And I have, you know, a couple, um, you know, I have a special relationship to the School of Public Health because when I was being recruited here, uh, actually 10 years ago, um, uh, the first people I met were in the School of Public Health. It was uh, Fox Weddle, who I had my very first met meeting, and she was explaining what was going on uh, at the school. And I'm like, wow, this is great. I could see all the incredible intellectual uh, collaborations, and it turned out to be uh, really uh, true. Since the school uh, was founded uh, 10 years ago, the trajectory has been really amazing. If you think about it, it started in 1971 as a community health department uh, in the School of Medicine. Uh, it gained uh, program status in 1995, school status in 2013, and since then, uh, we've been able to recruit an amazing group of faculty, expanding the tenure-track faculty from 10 in 2004 to 53 today, and cultivating a total faculty body of uh, over 150 uh, people, which is really amazing growth uh, for an academic uh, unit. But more than just the size, What's been incredible is the impact. I mean, SPH has been able to collaborate with not only the Department of, uh, of Health here in Rhode Island, uh, the Warren Al Alpert Medical School, Hasbro Children's uh, Hospital, Women and Infants uh, Hospital, and many other departments across uh, the university. And it's been an incredible, incredible uh, success story. And I want to really thank all of you uh, for making that happen. That's uh, what's so great about Brown is not necessarily the beautiful buildings. Even on a day like today, it looks incredible. It's not the campus per se as beautiful as it is. It's the people. Uh, and it's the quality of the people and it's the quality of the work uh, that's being done and uh, through the people, the incredible impact that Brown has through you uh, in the world, which has been really great. Um, I want to just uh, thank Ron uh, for stepping up uh, in his leadership role and really hitting uh, the ground uh, running. Um, today we have an amazing uh, leadership uh, team uh, with Ron, with Megan, and the whole group uh, working uh, so well. And the indicators of success are incredible. Uh, the applications uh, to the MPH program are sort of going through the roof. Uh, we've been able to uh, offer Brown's first fully online degree, the MPH. Uh, program uh, this year. Uh, NIH funding has been uh, incredible so that now our School of Public Health, only 10 years old, uh, is ranked fifth in, in NIH uh, funding. The undergraduate concentration has been, you know, really uh, thriving on every indicator, whether it's research, it's impact, it's educational innovation, et cetera. The school has been doing uh, incredibly uh, well. And so again, thank you uh, uh, for that. And more than just, again, the indicators, it's like, you know, the impact people are having on quality of life for aging uh, communities or our Alzheimer's work or the new work on pandemic preparedness or climate and information. I mean, such exciting things are going on uh, in the school. And just uh, to signal how that important is to the university as a whole, I think everyone in this room or tent uh, knows that um, you know the university has launched a draft uh, research plan, uh, very ambitious uh, plan, uh, achievable but ambitious to basically double research uh, volume at this university over the next five to seven years. And the School of Public Health is actually integral to that plan. One of the signature initiatives uh, is the Center for pandemic preparedness and response led by our new colleague, uh, uh, Jen uh, Nuzzo, uh, but many other parts of the School of Public Health are actually w w woven into uh, this plan. This is going to be incredible for Brown. You know, if we're able to achieve this plan, which I think we will, in the next five to seven years, this university will have a research portfolio that equals that of Emory University or the University of Chicago, but still remain that sort of distinctive 
place that pays attention to undergraduate education, interdisciplinary collaboration, and through our research and teaching, really trying to fulfill our mission of uh, to have a positive impact in the world. That's what I always think about Brown, is that it's such an important purpose-driven organization that always returns to those values, and through those values has the impact. So I want to thank you all for being here, and now let me uh, welcome to the stage our wonderful uh, interim dean, Ron O'Bear. Ron. Thank you, Rick. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, on such a beautiful day. Thank you for joining us for this important event. Let me start by acknowledging Provost Locke. Provost Locke was instrumental to bringing me to Brown, um, as well as many of you in the audience, I'm sure. <clears throat> he has been an unwavering supporter of the School of Public Health, as you already have seen. He is, uh, he is the muscle behind the institutional commitment to diversity amongst faculty in particular, as well as students. And he is an exemplar of fair and thoughtful leadership and I consider him a friend. Thank you again, Provost Locke. I'd also like to extend a welcome to our advisory council members and other friends of the School of Public Health who are joining us in person or virtually, or, or virtually via live stream. Now to our new students and faculty, welcome to Brown and the School of Public Health community. This is an extraordinary place for learning, research, and public health practice. It is an extraordinary place for collaboration across disciplines, both within the university and beyond our Van Wickle gates. Ours is a community that values diversity in all of its forms, equity, diversity, and inclusion. To our returning students and faculty and staff, welcome back. This is a vibrant community that you have fostered and continue to grow and strengthen. You've created a foundation that supports learning, research, and meaningful impact on our school of public health. We are currently in a moment of great public health challenges still. COVID persists despite the availability of vaccines, therapeutics. Too many lives have been and are being lost. Monkeypox is spreading with all too familiar frustrations around stigma, testing, treatment, and vaccination. Reports from New York of polio reemerging, a disease many thought to be nearly eradicated, are powerful indications of the need for our continued vigilance. And we continue to address the persistent plagues of gun violence, substance use disorder, and climate change as public health issues, all in an environment poisoned by myths and disinformation. This moment demands more from all of us. This is a great time to be in public health, but the demands are probably greater than they've ever been. Our mission demands that we strive to improve the health of all populations, especially those who are most vulnerable. We do this by producing world-class public health scholarship, forging strong community partnerships, and educating the next generation of public health leaders. Today, we can acknowledge important progress. Next year, as President, um, as Provost Locke um, currently uh, already pointed out, is the 10th anniversary of our school's founding. In that decade, we have already made an impact for good here in Rhode Island, the nation, and in, in, in the international stage. And there's so much more for us to do. <clears throat> we are we are together building a world-class school of public health. We are providing essential leadership and impact on the most urgent public health issues. We are making progress because of you. You have done amazing things. We are building on a strong faculty and student body by recruiting more of the most creative, innovative scholars and researchers and providing them what they need to be transformational. We are growing and continue to strengthen our identity with record-setting fundraising and plans for expansion in the coming years. We continue groundbreaking work through collaborations on aging, children's health, data science, opioid use, and so, so many other things. And we are launching new initiatives around pandemic preparedness, myths and disinformation, climate change and health, 
and health policy. We're finding new ways to study, teach, and practice public health, not just because we have a passion for this work, which we do, but we have to. The demand or the challenges of our day demanded. In a short while, we'll talk with a few of our public health colleagues who are deeply involved in pandemic response, preparedness, and prediction, and we'll learn more about the impact of the School of Public Health, how, how the School of Public Health is having in these areas. At the forefront of some of these persistent public health issues is academic Dean Megan Rainey, who brings medical and public health experience to her role. She is an ER physician and a researcher whose work lives at the intersection of digital health, firearm injury prevention, and population health. She is also a co-founder of what can be described as a movement, Get Us PPE, which delivered more than 14, 17 million pieces of personal protective equipment to healthcare providers around the country at the height of the pandemic. She is a frequent media contributor, a clear voice for clear data-driven communication and public health issues. Please welcome Dr. Rainey, who will provide a deeper view of how we study, teach, and practice public health to have greater impact. Dr. Rainey, or Dean Rainey, excuse me. Thank you, Ron, for your leadership and service as interim dean at this important time. I'm so pleased and honored to be working with you to help set the course for this amazing school. I also want to thank Provost Locke and President Paxson for their leadership and steadfast support of the School of Public Health. We wouldn't be here today without you. But my job is actually much more fun, which is that I get to welcome back faculty and staff. Uh, I'm so appreciative of everything that all of you have done over the past two and a half years and most importantly, to welcome back our students. Whether this is your first time joining us for State of the School, or whether you're returning to Brown, ready to kick off another exciting academic year, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here with us. Ron is right when he says that this moment of great public health challenges deserves more and demands more from all of us. And today I'm here to share just a few examples of how we are giving more, doing more, and demanding more for ourselves. We believe in creating, and we are actually doing the work to create a school that transforms, as Ron said, how we study, teach, and practice public health, locally, nationally, and across the globe. So let me start by talking a little bit about our educational program. Before I start, can our students actually raise their hands, no matter what level you are? Welcome. <laughs> So excited to have you here. You are what makes Brown Brown, as Provost Locke said. Our dedication to our students is truly our first priority. And part of that is that we're committed to changing both who and how we teach. I'm thrilled to welcome all of you, the very best and brightest, to our master's and PhD programs. And if any of our undergrad concentrators are here, to welcome you as well, with truly record-breaking numbers of the very highest quality students. But I'm also excited that we're opening doors and expanding opportunities, including increasing financial aid, which I know is so important for our master's students, to help create a new generation of public health leaders. You are leaders who are diverse, inclusive, and well-prepared to meet the challenges that we face, not just now, but over the next quarter and half century, particularly when race, income, and other structural factors get in the way of being healthy. As you heard, we launched a brand new online Masters of Public Health program this year, and I want to say just a couple of words about it. This new online program is specifically designed to offer working professionals around the world greater access to graduate education from this extraordinary School of Public Health and this great university. And I know that we're simulcasting this, so I want to welcome our online MPH students who are joining us today from Canada, Europe, Africa, and throughout the United States. A warm welcome to all of you and welcome to our Brown community. I also want to give a special welcome to our Health Equity Scholars. This is a program that started last year with 12 scholars. This year we've increased to 19 new students in 2022, part of the demonstration of our commitment to expanding who and how we train, and then to going back and actually making a difference in communities across the United States and across the globe. So to all of our students, whether you're sitting here in person or joining us remotely, welcome. We're so glad to have you and so honored to get to be your faculty, your staff, 
and your colleagues over the next few years as you're here at Brown. The second thing I want to talk about is about how we're doing the work to change how and why we study and practice public health. I don't need to say this, we know that our scholarship is cutting edge, but we also understand that what takes place here on campus, whether within Van Wickle Gates or at 121 South Main or One Dayval, that matters for public health, but what matters more is what we do to share that knowledge with a broader audience out into the world to actually change the structural policy and behavioral drivers of health. On this important action and on these important issues, we are truly breaking new ground. It is what keeps me here at Brown. It what makes me so proud to be Brown faculty and so proud to have this academic dean position. It's looking at all of the ways that our faculty, our students and staff are going out and actually changing things. So let me share a few highlights for those of you that are newer or who may be less familiar or who don't know what your colleagues are doing. This is a snapshot. This is far from the full picture, but it's a few things that I wanted to call out this year. First, our faculty are exploring new and broader views of what public health means. We're considering the structural and social aspects of epidemiology and, and social science in ways that are not always typical for schools of public health. We're examining, for example, the impact of noise pollution, impact uh, access to green spaces, housing discrimination, uh, racist policies on the health and resilience of communities, and are looking at how to change those. Another example, we're leading national and international efforts to develop and evaluate new diagnostic methods for identifying disease. For example, we're using really cool advanced data science methods to better identify cancers early and accurately. And I wanna give a shout out to the folks that are doing that. On long COVID, as some of you may know, we're leading a new collaborative program of scholarship to understand the implications of this syndrome and to guide businesses, policymakers, and patients as they make decisions about how to manage this relatively new, long-term, but still very poorly defined group of symptoms. And our scholars are, of course, studying how to make existing healthcare policy work better and how to change it for the future, whether on Medicare Advantage or long-term care facilities to maximize health for all. Finally, as Ron will talk about, as we're going to host people up, we're launching a bunch of exciting new centers and initiatives. Wait for next year. I'll share more about those in next year's State of the School. So the last thing that I want to talk about is the biggest measure of transformation. Listen, those of you that know me know that I've been part of this school since before it was a school, right? I've been here for almost 20 years. I've been so proud to watch us go along that journey um, that Provost Locke talked about. I know that our work has always had impact in the world. But I really think that the way that the world knows about the Brown School of Public Health, the way that they link our work to the change in the world has transformed over the last two years. Now, obviously throughout the COVID pandemic, the Brown School of Public Health has been and continues to be a central source of information to guide policymakers and the public. Dina Shisha was originally a powerful outside voice and national leader and now is guiding policy and action at the highest levels of the White House, although we of course look forward to his return. But in, we're also doing a lot of other stuff, right? We're strengthening existing community connections and forging new ones, creating new community spaces to allow us to address substance use disorder, for example. We're informing national policy on nicotine levels in cigarettes and vaping. This work is potentially transformative in informing US and global population health particularly among those vulnerable populations who shoulder so much of the continued burden of smoking-related disease, an incredible example of the impact of the work that we do. And we're exploring novel approaches to HIV prevention, to violence, one of my own pet issues, and much, much more I could go on, whether locally, again, nationally, or globally. We're working with government, businesses, online media, and nonprofit leaders across the globe to make sure they have the best evidence and the best recommendations on the wide variety of topics that we specialize in here at the Brown School of Public Health to keep communities healthy, which is what only public health can do. Right? I, as a doctor, as well as a public health professional, we sit in a unique space, and I'm just so honored to be here. So I'm going to close by talking just a little bit about what is yet to come. Here at the Brown School of Public Health, we have built and continue to grow a truly unique public health community focused on problem solving. 
we are dedicated to learning by doing. And to all of our students, you will have seen that phrase all over as you were applying, as you come into our space, and hopefully you will experience that as true over the years that you're here with us. I know that we are uniquely positioned to increase knowledge and inform action on the most urgent, important public health challenges we face here in Rhode Island as a nation and across the globe. In the coming year, we're preparing to hire a new full-time director of community engagement for the School of Public Health, who will work closely with President Paxson's newly elevated uh, cabinet level position dedicated to community engagement. This position is so important because we know that Rhode Island is our home and we're dedicated to working in and with our community to recognize the experience and priorities of our neighbors in Rhode Island and our neighbors across the country. We also are committed in the coming year to further expanding who can participate in Brown's public health educational offerings and who gains access to these amazing faculty. Next year, for example, we're going to be launching a new accelerated master's program for clinicians. This will allow us to provide a one-year degree to people with existing clinical doctoral training. We need more doctors, dentists, doctorates of nursing, clinical psychologists, and others to understand the theory and practice of public health and to be able to put it in place. We're also, of course, working hard to raise more financial aid for our students, knowing that this is another major way that we can influence the world. And we're designing and launching a number of short courses and certificates for folks who live and work across the world. Stay tuned for more on those. So in close, I and all of us here are confident that a new, more diverse generation of public health leaders will drive action where it is needed most, often in communities that are overlooked. I know that here at the Brown School of Public Health, we are defining and redefining the public health of the future in a way that is transformative equitable and inclusive. This takes work, but we're doing it. And in the process, we are together establishing the Brown School of Public Health as one of the nation's top and most equitable public health schools. So with that, it is now my great pleasure to introduce you to a few of the people whose work I've been talking about. They join us today to participate in a panel discussion, providing a real world view into how their work and the Brown School of Public Health are impacting our broader community. So first, Dr. Will Goodell is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology. His work uses spatial analytical techniques to quantify the burden of disease and then develop prevention and mitigation efforts that leverage community assets and experience. Will is a graduate of our own Epi PhD program, and he has been an effective and widely known voice for an aggressive and equitable response to monkeypox advocating for strategies to test and treat populations most at risk. Dr. Mark Lurie is an associate professor and infectious disease epidemiologist who's done extensive work on HIV AIDS, sexually transmitted infections, and silicosis and tuberculosis in sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Lurie was recently awarded a $1 million grant from the National Science Foundation, which we'll talk about, for a super innovative project, Mobility Analysis for Pandemic Prevention Strategies. He also teaches a terrific graduate student course this semester on pandemics, which for grad students who are still looking for courses, I recommend you check out. Finally, Dr. Jennifer Nuzo recently joined the Brown School of Public Health faculty as a professor of epidemiology and, as Provost Locke mentioned, the inaugural director of the Pandemic Center. Dr. Nuzo's work focuses on global health security, public health preparedness and response, and health systems resilience. She advises governments and organizations on pandemic preparedness and regularly engages with the media to educate and inform the public about emerging health security trends. So, Will, Jennifer, Mark, it is my pleasure to welcome you and to join all of you in listening to this conversation. Dr. Obear will moderate, so I'll welcome him back up as well. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jen, Mark, and Will for joining this discussion. So our goal this afternoon is to allow these three amazing leaders to share with us their view from the front lines of public health and importantly, the Brown School of Public Health. Dean Rainey and I have provided an overview of our guiding principles 
and public health challenges we face and how we are working to meet those challenges through education, research, knowledge creation, and sharing. We're opening new doors to a diverse group of future, health, of future public health leaders and to established practitioners who need to know more. Let's talk about how that's happening and the impact it's having on campus and beyond. So the first question, we are still fighting the COVID pandemic while facing new threats from monkeypox and now the reports of polio in New York. Do we have the data and information we need to meet these challenges? Mark, I'm gonna start with you. I think you know my answer, right? Uh, I think we have a lot more data than we used to have. We're certainly building in that area, but I think there are a lot of areas that we're lacking and I suppose this is my opportunity to advertise our new project, which um, takes as its central focus the idea, the simple idea that uh, diseases, infectious diseases, are spread from humans to humans, right? And unless we really understand the ways that humans interact, we're going to be doomed to policies that are very broad, that impact all kinds of behaviors that are not necessarily behaviors that are likely to be involved in transmission. If we, on the other hand, are able to systematically understand the, the context and the environments under which different people interact, then we have the opportunity to target interventions that are specific to those kinds of behaviors. And, and I think we're really using data in its best way. And that's one of the things we're trying to do in the center is to harness data, particularly around mobility, uh, population movement, and social interaction. So we're working with um, people in public health, of course, but also uh, people in uh, engineering who are designing devices to, uh, whether wearables or app devices, to measure social interaction that are gonna be important for us in our project to then feed into our mathematical models to predict future pandemics and to try to prevent them. So I think that's one example of kinds of data that we still really need and to be able to make really smart, informed, and targeted decisions. Great. Um Will, do you have anything else you want to contribute to that? Yeah, I would say that often when we're talking about data-driven decision-making, we're talking about data that is generated from clinical settings or generated in the academy, but that the communities of people that are most directly impacted by these new challenges bring a lot of knowledge and, and, and data of their own that we need to equally respect. Um, whether it's a new challenge that we haven't seen before like COVID or a re-emerging challenge like monkeypox or polio, we know that uh, epidemic diseases tend to follow along the cracks in society, and we know that there are communities that are made structurally vulnerable that are going to hit, get hit first, hit hardest, and come out of a surge last. And so regardless of what the challenge is, we know that we have enough data and enough history to show that we know where we need to start most often, whether that's in, in low- and middle-income countries that have been under-resourced or deprived of resources, or whether that's in the U.S. and our communities that are uh, marginalized by race or by socioeconomic status, we know that we have to start there first. So at least that always gives us a, a, a better insight into sort of where the needle in the haystack should be when we get started. Jennifer, you're charged with launching this new <clears throat> pandemic preparedness and response center. How does this question fit in? How do their responses fit into what your goals are gonna be for the center? Um, so it starts with data. I mean, it absolutely starts with data. And it starts with the data that we do have, which is the fact that these infectious disease emergencies that you very aptly listed um, in the opening remarks are increasing in frequency. It, it feels like you keep hearing about these things in the news more and more. That's because the data tells us that they are act actually happening more frequently. And in many ways, these events are... Um, not singular, they're actually the hazards of our time. So the data tells us these are the hazards of our times and we need to prepare for them like we do prepare for other hazards that prevail in our lives, like fires, like natural hazards. So that's the data that we have. But as Mark and Will very um, you know, clearly stated, there are data that we do not have and clearly it's the data that we need to support the decisions about how best to respond, and about how best to prepare for these events such that they never again, like COVID did, upend our lives in the way and cause um, really unprecedented levels of, of, of human suffering. Um, and so that's, I think, an important role for academic 
um, partners um, to both be the place where the data can be generated to answer the most pertinent questions about how we best prepare and respond to these events, but then to recognize and to advance and continue to beat the drum that data is not the end. Data is the start of a process that leads to better decisions and actions taken to avert the harms that we are so worried about in the first place. And I, uh, you know, particularly after the last two years, will believe that um, independent expert voices will remain essential to making sure not only that the data are at the forefront, but that it doesn't just end with the data, that we translate those data to actions and to make sure that continues to happen. And I'm very excited to be here, to be part of the conversation that Brown has been leading for the last two years, to make sure that we are the source of the data and that we continue to advocate for their use. Great. So I'm going to stay with this theme just a little while longer. So we have a little bit of time, it seems. So Jennifer, you just finished a round of speed dating um, <laughs> at the, um, um, the recent reception that we attended, where you were talking to people who are very anxious to work with you and you're very anxious to collaborate with. Um, how, do you, how do you see some of the input from those potential collaborators into your strategy for building the, uh, the new center? Um, so the potential to collaborate within the school and beyond the school is why I'm here. Um, it became, it was a screaming truth over the last two years that some of our largest problems in responding to COVID were not just limited to medical and public health constraints. I'm an epidemiologist and I've studied uh, these events. I've been working on pandemic preparedness for the better part of my 20 plus year career. And I have seen um, that what we, uh, have learned time and time again is that when these events happen, they expose the cracks in our societies. They magnify the cracks in our societies. They take advantage of the cracks in our societies. And so if we only prepare for these events from say, you know, trying to deal with the pathogen and not the context in which the pathogen is exploiting, uh, we are going to fail. And that's clearly what has happened in the past two years. So um, it is really important for people who have worked on these issues from the medical and public health lens and epidemiologic lens that I've worked on to make sure we have connections to the broader communities, to, to the broader levels of expertise, so the social sciences, history, the humanities, economics, political science, to make sure that what we are planning uh, makes sense for the communities, makes sense for what we've learned throughout the years, um, and that it is sufficient to meet the needs of, of the people that we are hoping um, to meet them. So I'm absolutely thrilled. It's the reason why um, I picked my family up and moved them to the beautiful state of Rhode Island um, to have conversations uh, with other expertise that I didn't have um, if I were only collaborating within a, the walls of the School of Public Health. Mark, you uh, mentioned in your remarks that um, your project, the NSF project, is, is a collaboration with the School of Engineering. Now, now, in terms of Providence FAR, that's as far as you can get from the School of Public Health to across campus. <laughs> so how did that collaboration come to be, and how did, how did, how did you all come together to decide that, that you were going to work together to address this particular issue? It's a really interesting question because we, we often talk about, you know, the need for collaboration. I think we all embrace multiple uh, viewpoints that, you know, add to a solid collective idea of what it is that we're trying to address. Um, actually, this collaboration came about because it was structured and required. Mm -hmm. the, um, the funding institution required, as they were setting up new centers to predict and prevent future pandemics, that there were four disciplines at least that needed to be involved. Public health, uh, engineering, computer science, and uh, mathematics. And so we built our idea around that because that was the structure of um, what the call for proposals was. But in fact, it was an amazing opportunity not only to collaborate across Brown with people who I never knew I shared interests with, uh, but who have unbelievable things to contribute. Um, people who are deeply involved in modeling pandemics, um, sitting in engineering department. Um, but more importantly, to be able to build on their skills that uh, contribute to our broader project. So for instance, I mentioned the engineers. Um, uh, the engineering uh, component of this project amongst other things, involves trying to develop new technologies to measure the kinds of outcomes that we're interested in. Population movement, so your kind of geographic footprint, 
and your interactions with other people. Um, so we have um, a, a cohort of 24 um, engineering students who have signed up this year as part of their capstone project, who are going to be working closely with faculty who are part of MAPS, but also engineering faculty, math faculty, and others who make up our uh, center, uh, and going to be working specifically to develop that device, that app, that is then going to be used. So, so I think um, across Brown, there are these pockets of people <laughs> who are doing incredible things. And this was uh, an opportunity to, to really exploit that um, in the best way. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this project. For years, I've been collaborating with people in, in our building and public health, and that's been fabulous and rewarding and, and, and you know, hopefully somewhat groundbreaking in some, way, in some small way. Um, but honestly, the opportunity to collaborate now across the university is just a whole new horizon for me and, and a whole new opportunity that I'm really excited about yeah, and, I, and excited to get students involved in too. I would just like to point out that that collaboration has led to another which is around aging and, that, and people are very excited about that and that would also include the School of Medicine. So it's very exciting to see these sort of connections being made. And then, Will, I know one of the things that you do as well as research, you're, you're, you're going to be one of our if not already, one of the master teachers in the School of Public Health. So a quick question for you is, as all this starts to evolve, how do you sort of take this information, build it into the foundational classes, and respond to a changing or diversity of students that will include more humanities students, more engineering students, more uh, students across campus, uh, not just students of public health? Yeah, that's an interesting question right before I got to this event, I was teaching, I teach our undergraduate introductory course in epidemiology and I'm teaching it for the first time this semester. And one of the sort of guiding principles behind my course design is that how I see it as an epidemiologist is that epidemiology is a set of tools that we have. It is not any one topic area. It is not applicable to only certain health issues and that in all of our training efforts, we need people to see that our public health tools are applicable to any challenge that they are going to be facing. One of the things that I really try to center in my teaching as an epidemiologist is that they can apply things to classical infectious diseases that the history of epidemiology has traditionally focused on. They can focus on chronic diseases, but they can apply it to social issues too. And I hope that our students can start to see that whatever it is that is of concern to them in their community, they can apply these tools for. And on the other hand, it's also creating opportunities for them to do that in applied way so that they can see from the beginning that it translates directly into practice. Uh, I teach a graduate level course in spatial analysis. That's my methodological happy place as an epidemiologist. And um, one, of the, one of the sort of guiding elements for that course is that it's done collaboratively with our local health department. We have tremendous, brilliant minds at our Rhode Island Department of Health that I adore working with, but they don't have enough hours in the day to do all of the things that they need to do to generate all the insights that they need to generate. And so that course is set up in a way so that programs at the Department of Health can say, we have you know, needs for spatial analysis in our program. We don't have time, we don't have the skills. Can this be something that your students work on throughout the semester? They gain those skills and the product goes directly back to the health department. It's not just a class assignment that they get a final grade on and it's done. It sort of takes on a life of its own once it's there. And I hope we can develop more of those kind of practice-based opportunities for our students so that they can see where their skills go um, in the future and that it takes all kinds of people to, to build the kind of public health we want to see. And honestly, to rebuild public health. It was public health departments were emaciated pre-COVID and they've yeah. only been further devastated and so getting people excited to want to jump back into that part of our field is, is a big priority for me I think as an educator because uh, we, we need it. We need strong local, state, and federal and global health departments to be able to do everything that we need to do. Yes, that's a, I love that response. So <clears throat> the second question is we're working, we're working hard to build a new generation of public health leaders who have deep lived experience in communities that have been left out or left behind. COVID exposed longstanding disparities in our public health system. How do we address these disparities? I'm starting with you, Jen. I know this is something that you're very passionate about. 
Yeah, and I just, I have to react to what you just said because it's really extraordinary. And um, that, in my view, is the future of public health education, public health practice. I think all schools of public health will eventually be there, but I'm so incredibly proud that Brown is leading in that direction. And that actually, I think, is a nice segue to the question that you ask, um, which is how do we address this? Um, you know, COVID is an unfortunate magnifying event it magnified uh, our already existing um, health disparities, um, but it also magnified attention to these issues. We need to continue to increase the attention. We need to continue to increase the progress. But I do think that it started what had been a long overdue conversation about the social determinants of health and that it's not just about the pathogen, it's about thinking about society. So one of the ways that we address it is exactly through um, the work that Will is doing, where you, um, as a school, are leading in partnership with your students and the communities, um, the, the, the government agencies that are responsible for the health of communities, but also engaging um, the contributions of the communities themselves, so that we make sure that the, the work reflects um, not only the realities, um, but also the values of, of, the, of the communities, and to do that in partnership. Um, and I think that that's really going to be the future. Um, the other thing that we do is through who we educate and making sure that we include in our educational plan, and this is another um, thing that I'm extraordinarily proud to be at Brown for because Brown is truly leading in this effort, is to um, increase the diversity of students who are here because we cannot go through another pandemic with leaders that do not come from the communities that have been hardest hit by this virus and viruses that will come. So we need to make sure that we train the next generation of pandemic leaders so that we can develop plans that are reflective of um, the experiences and realities of the communities that the plans are intended for. Will, do you have anything else? I mean, that was a pretty comprehensive response. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to follow, Jen. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I think a lot about, because I'm a, I'm a COVID baby as an epidemiologist, you know, I graduated kind of into this, and so it's, it's the only world I know as a, as a professional at this point, um, is that community leaders have the power to, un have the capability to understand a lot more data than we give them credit for. Um, it's some of the initiatives that I think I'm most proud of during my time at Brown. I want to give a big shout out to my team in the People, Place, and Health Collective. One of our kind of hallmark sets of initiatives is making data dashboards that are for community leaders specifically, making sure that our community leaders know some of the common epi speak. They know the difference between a count, a rate, and a percentage, and can use those effectively. They come with so much knowledge and information on their own to be able to say, I know someone in my community that is really struggling with this health issue and that if they know where to go to get data to say there are a thousand other people in my neighborhood that I know have this same experience, they can demand more of the agencies that provide services to them. They can demand more of the governments that are supposed to be providing for them. And it's always my hope that we as sort of the data people can be providing sort of the data sound bites that go along with their advocacy. You know, I was, I was at the Society for Epidemiologic Research annual meeting back in June on a session on science in an age of anti-science, and Sheryl Barber, who's a professor at Drexel, mentioned that one of the most important things we can do as scientists is sort of be the footnote to movement work. We don't have to be the ones that are on the front lines deciding what changes need to be made, but we can be the ones that provide the data to back up what changes community leaders want to see for themselves. Um, so that's one of the things that I hope our sort of next generation of public health leaders sees for themselves, is that we can bring in people who come from communities that have not gotten what they've deserved and we can be the data people that can provide the, sort of the hard numbers to show people sort of how much further we need to go and give people that power to demand more because communities of all kinds across the world deserve more than they get. So you opened up the stage for this next question and in this age of pandemics, communicating is an essential skill set to public health. Communicating science, communicating public health issues, um, we're asked to be the messengers and advocates, as well as researchers and practitioners. What role will communications play in the lives of the future public health leaders that are here today? What advice would you give them? Um, I'm going to start with I'm going to start with you, uh, Mark. So I think you know our future public health leaders are are going to be faced with with a lot of challenges. You know, on the one hand, 
We're sort of the flavor of the month. Um, everybody wants to be friends with an epidemiologist. Uh, it gets you inside information about how long you should, you should isolate or uh, what you should do about a recent exposure. Uh, on the other hand, we're under attack more than ever before. Uh, and I think that presents a real dilemma, but also you know, an opportunity to really um, emphasize the, the values and the way that the public health and epidemiology in particular um, is, is a discipline that, that can contribute in a positive way to, to our prevention of future pandemics. And, and that's around you know, an honest and an open conversation about what data really means and, and what science really is and, and what denialism is. And I think we have a long way to go um, before we, as public health uh, people, are, are really skilled at being able to, to hold that conversation in a really meaningful way. So I do hope that, hope that our future leaders are, are, are going, to, going to help us, to guide us through that, because that is a difficult conversation. And I know for myself, uh, despite training at a very good institution, uh, we never learned public health communication. Uh, we never, um, you know, we never discussed the importance of, uh, you know, how the clarity with which we, we uh, communicate our scientific values and findings. Um, that was something, you know, that was not a part of your training. And, and I think it's a positive step forward that we, we do have that in the School of Public Health and increasingly are bringing in people with expertise in that area who are able to train our future leaders to be able to take on that challenge. Yeah, I think if you and I had been trained, Mark, I don't think it would have mattered because the landscape is so much more complicated now. And I think that's why one of the great things about being at Brown now is this emphasis on information disorders through the Information Futures Lab, the focus is on how to address myths and disinformation. Um, and so back to you, Will, since you're the classroom guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not the only one, but I, wanna, I want you to sort of, sort of wrestle with or, or, or help us sort of, sort of walk through for our, the future public health leaders, mm -hmm. communication is going to be such a huge part mm -hmm. of how they perform as a, as a public health practitioner and a public health um, leader. So tell me, what, how, do we, how do we get them ready? Because... You know, now we're talking the whole social media framework that they have to be familiar with. Mm -hmm. what, how, how, do you, how do we sort of work that into the training of, of the future public health leaders? I think part of it is making sure that we're encouraging people not to be afraid of it because mm -hmm. the landscape is so massive and it changes so quickly and things can be misinterpreted very, very quickly. And so we need to encourage people to take it on head on look to our experts in the social sciences that are the experts on how to communicate to people. You know, we might not have all the answers in public health about how to be effective communicators, but there are scholars in the humanities and the behavioral sciences and social sciences that know how to craft a message and get it out there. Um, I think we need to be fundamentally thinking about how we are asking students to show off their skills in our classroom, that sometimes that 15 page paper is not the right way to have them show off that they know how to translate or summarize research findings. And sometimes you might want to actually have them summarize it in a Twitter thread or something like that. I think I'd encourage all of our faculty to not be super scared of these new modalities either. Um, we've got to figure out how to tackle them because the, the side that's working against us uses these tools very, very effectively. And that means that we can also use them very, very effectively to get back at them. I think the other piece of it just fundamentally is ensuring that all of our trainees maintain a broad imagination in terms of what's possible. We can't be putting limits on what's sort of possible as a public health action. Um, we've got to be communicating for what is right and necessary, not what's logical or serves the majority of people who are the least vulnerable best. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot to think about in terms of communication exercises, but that it needs to be incorporated into every corner of our training, that it's not just, did you do the science well? It's, it's did you say it in a way that gets to the person who needs, it, who needs to hear it? Anything else to add, Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate what you just said. I mean, I think for me, one of the privileges of what has been incredibly difficult um, past two plus years has been the opportunities I've had to communicate with 
um, you know, directly hundreds, I, I've lost count, of, of people. I mean, all manner of people, various d different groups, different sectors, from the Kardashians to QAnon. I mean, really, I've been able to connect with people um, across. And it's been extraordinary because, uh, to, to me, it's been one of the most meaningful aspects of this pandemic is just to, to be in the lives of, of people during this time. Um, so I, I think communication is incredibly important. Communication is probably one of our most important public health interventions. Um, but I think there are some lessons from the past two years. Um, one is that communications is not a shortcut to enga for engagement, right? We, we need to engage with communities. We need to build trust. We need to serve communities. So that has to be the basis. And then, of course, communication is the way that you can continue to work with them and to serve them. Um, poor communications can evaporate trust in a minute. And so that piece, I think, makes the stakes quite high. And it's one of the reasons, and I'm glad you mentioned sort of the social science research, that we need to make communications a discipline, and it is a discipline, but we need to continue to expand it and invest in understanding how to message and what messages work and how to engage and how to engage in communications. Um, and that's just something that I hope the sort of future of the field will continue to invest in so that we can expand the evidence base for effective communications. I will also say that the, the landscape has changed, particularly from a social media perspective. And it's been humbling to me to possibly think that some of the greatest impact I've had have been through tweets and op-eds than any of the scholarly papers that I've written. Uh, that is just the world that we live in. Policy is often advanced in 140 characters. Um, so I really do think that we have to teach how to use these tools effectively. And um, while we're doing that, I think one important uh, truism of public health is that it should always start from a place of empathy. And so while social media perhaps rewards attacks and you know, snarky comments, I'm, I have not seen any evidence that that's the way to advance change. But starting with empathy, growing the field, elevating the voices that need to be elevated and not necessarily attacking the voices that you disagree with, in my view, has a, a better path to, to sh a shorter path to change. So I was speaking with a student <clears throat> right before uh, this session. And um, one of the things that I was telling, we were going back and forth about some of the new things that are happening. You're getting a taste of that now. And um, the student will be a, is a junior this year. And it's very happy they're not a senior because they're looking forward to all the things that we have to come. Um, and so it's a great time to be in public health. I think, um, and the student was, was saying that he's very, very happy that he's here. Um, and you got a sense of that and a taste of that through this panel. So I want to thank you all for contributing so much to today's discussion. Thank you. thank you all for joining us in person and online. And I invite you to join us now at the back of the, back of the tent for a reception celebrating this day, our school, and the year ahead. Thank you. <laughs>